Daniel Holmesy, Director of the Neighborhood Empowerment Network, here today at San Francisco City Hall for the 2018 Bay Area Regional Summit on Community Resilience. An amazing group of people have come together here at City Hall today to talk about this important issue. We literally have people from all over the Bay Area, Los Angeles, and even people from Canada to come and talk about this important issue. Now, today we have a keynote address by Professor Daniel Aldrich from Northeastern University, focusing on the essential role that social cohesion plays in building truly resilient communities. So take a minute, sit back and hear what this brilliant man has to say about this important approach. Who's ever had an aha moment, right? An aha moment. Like the people, how many, all of you are Bitcoin millionaires, so you, you, you had, that was that aha moment, right? But I remember on a Muni train, um, probably six or seven years ago, I downloaded this white paper and it was on the power of social cohesion and disaster recovery. And I'm reading this article and as you can imagine, some people when I get going look at me a little bit like, I see a real powerful combination of Ritalin and some kind of set, you know, uh, that, that would really help you succeed. And I'm like, no, you don't get it. Like I'm an idiot on fire. Like I know we need to do this work. But there was a remarkable little data out there that really articulated the power, quantitative and qualitatively, of the social cohesion aspect of disaster preparedness. It was all about kits, kits, kits. And I'm like, I don't think that's the solution. I think it's about connection and then the kits come into play, right? And I downloaded this white paper and I was on the Muni heading downtown and I started reading Daniel's work and I got so excited, I, cu I couldn't read anymore. Like, I was just like, I couldn't even get to page two. I'm like, this is the holy grail, right? This is it. And so since then, Dan and I have built this great partnership. But I just want to offer that this gentleman here has done more to help the community resilience space from an academic side than anyone else I know. And, and he'll share more with you about his work. But the bottom line is, is that we need his voice in the room so that people will take our passion seriously, if you know what I mean by that. So I'm excited for you to hear his, about his work because for me, it is the one um, data point I point to all the time saying, so if you think I'm wrong, then explain to him why he's wrong and he'll explain to you why that's impossible. <laughs> and the lightning rod for Dan Homsey. Thank you. So first of all, thank you all so much. I know lunch is next. It's a hard point to be in the, in the day. But um, you know, this for me be, began actually even in 2005. Uh, we had moved down to New Orleans, Louisiana, and we had about six really good weeks there in New Orleans. We had a new house, a new car, filled our home with furniture, and then, of course, on the 28th of August, we had the arrival of Hurricane Katrina, which really changed your perspective when you lose your job, the things that you own, you and your family were evacuated out of the city to Houston. So we began thinking about this from a personal perspective. What will it take for us to bounce back? Back at the time, we had two little kids, now we have four. Probably a mistake, but that's a different question. And, and, you know, we saw around us this idea of what will it take for our home, our neighborhood, our city to recover if it in fact can recover over time. All the literature out there talks about infrastructure, about housing and buildings and kits and all that kind of stuff. And that seemed interesting to some degree, but didn't match what we saw. Right? In fact, I try to map what we saw. This map you see, it's kind of hard to see from where you're sitting, is a map of New Orleans. And that map of New Orleans has on it thousands of interviews that we did with people around the city. And we asked them a very simple question. In the years since Hurricane Katrina, how are you doing? How is the recovery process going for you? And then we asked them how much water was in their home and their business, where they lived. And if you could see this map, you'd notice something very interesting. I assumed individuals with more water in their homes, with more damage to their businesses, would tell us things are going very badly. That wasn't the case at all. In fact, you see some of the best recoveries are some of the worst hit areas in the city. I began to think then, if resilience isn't a function of damage, what's driving this process over time? Why did some people tell us things were going well for them despite having 12 feet of water in their home for two months? If there's one takeaway message from all the work I've done since then, it's the following idea. That what drives resilience, what drives recovery, isn't going to come from a kit. It's not going to come from an outside speaker like me. It won't come from someone like Dan Holmes. It'll come from you and your communities and your neighbors. Whom do you know? Whom do you trust? Whom do you work with? Over and over again, we see that what really drives the process is having connections. 
And there are three types of connections we can talk about. Bonding ties, bridging ties, and linking ties. Bonding ties are between friends, family, kin, people who are quite similar already. But bridging ties bring people together, maybe through a sports club, through a church, a synagogue, a mosque. Maybe they come together through a meeting like this one. And finally, linking ties are vertical ones between me and someone in FEMA, between you and the mayor. These different types of ties play different roles in this disaster space as bad things happen to us. The first choice that we have to make after a disaster is whether or not to go back to that damaged home, that damaged business, and to rebuild, or if we move someplace else. We found around the world what drives the processes of leaving, of exit, often is not a question of money, but a question of connection. If you feel connected to your home, if you feel you have friends and family nearby, if you feel driven to live there, this is where you want to be, it doesn't matter how much it will cost. It doesn't matter how much time it will take or the gap between insurance and the actual costs of rebuilding. That sense of belonging will bring us home no matter what. In contrast, if you feel betrayed by leaders, if you don't have trust with people living nearby, if you don't have a sense of neighborhoods, then coming back will be a very costly and unlikely process for you. We call this exit or voice. And we've found over and over again around the world, individuals with connections, they use voice. They work together to rebuild their communities. And people who don't feel connected, those individuals often use exit instead. We also know many of the challenges that we face post-disaster are what we call collective action challenges. They require people working together. No one family, no one organization, no one can do it by themselves. To rebuild, to bring back property values, to bring back schools, bring back businesses, they require us all working together. That's much easier in communities where we have trust and connections and we have experience working together. It's much harder to get collective action if you don't trust your neighbors, if you don't trust your first responders, if you don't trust the local government there with you in that place where you live. So all of these collective action problems, rebuilding, debris removal, building back organizations, they require us to work together as a community. The last way we see these ties working is what we call informal insurance or mutual aid. As we heard already, after disasters, most providers of medical care, of help, of information, of food, water, and gasoline, they're shut down for days, if not weeks. How do we find someone to help us if we don't know anyone nearby? If the daycare is closed, who'll be watching my kids? If there's no gasoline nearby, how do I get to work? And we see around the world, whether in San Francisco, in Boston, in India, or in Japan, what drives us getting help and resources come from people living nearby that we know, that we trust, that we've worked with. This is not a formal insurance program where you pay in. This is an informal insurance where you've built trust and relationships over time. If you haven't built those before the disaster, it's much harder afterwards to draw on them and get those kind of assistance that we'll need. This is all kind of abstract right now. I'm gonna give us some real information. We've heard already mentioned that seven years ago, in Japan, there were three massive disasters at the exact same time. We had a 9.0 earthquake at 2.46 p.m. on the 11th of March, 2011. That earthquake then triggered a massive tsunami, a huge wall of water 60 feet tall in some places. And those two together then shut down nuclear power plants at Fukushima, and that itself caused meltdowns at three of the reactors. So imagine not only do you have an earthquake and a tsunami, you also have radioactive contamination going on. And my job the last six years now has been studying these aspects of Japan and how they did or didn't recover. We noticed immediately that across cities and towns in Tohoku, where the earthquake and tsunami hit, the levels of mortality, the levels of people dying were quite different. In some cities, no one passed away. In some areas, as many as one in 10 people died in that wave. What drove that difference? Why did some communities have the ability to have so many people survive? Others were literally decimated. One in 10 died. We first imagined what would drive that would be the power of the wave. Maybe communities hit by higher waves would have higher mortality. Just like in New Orleans, that wasn't the case. 
In fact, we had many communities with lower waves with higher mortality. So why did some communities then have higher or lower mortality? We looked first to test five different theories you hear about all the time. Different ideas of what connects mortality and disasters. The most obvious, of course, is the power of the disaster. I think now we've shown that not to be the case. It's not that a more powerful disaster results in more mortality. We also looked closely at politics. Could political assistance, for example, from a certain party in power make a difference in pre preparation and more spending beforehand? We looked at earthquake preparation and disaster preparation. We looked at the amount of money spent on things like seawalls. We looked at demographics as well. And finally, we looked at social ties and social cohesion. What kind of connections were there in the city? What kind of abilities we have people to trust each other? The best driver of recovery and survival in Tohoku didn't come from demographics, didn't come from spending. It came from trust and cohesion. Those communities in Japan, in the 140 towns and villages along the coast that had those higher levels of trust, they had lower levels of mortality. In similar communities nearby that had less trust, less interaction, those communities had more dead bodies afterwards, holding everything else constant. So again, the first stage of recovery being driven by these horizontal ties. This image now is the city of Ishinomaki, taken two weeks and then two years after disaster. And if you can see the image, in one there's debris, there's bicycles and cars on the ground. In the other image, two years later, all that's gone. But you know what we don't know? We don't know if these communities have recovered. Have they bounced back after those two years? This is a similar city called Sendai, the community of Tagajo. And there is two weeks, two years, and then two years ago. I can't explain why those white vans are still there over time. <laughs> Maybe insurance fraud, but that's a different discussion. But we see in these communities that as debris is being removed, we don't really know. Are businesses back up again? Are schools operating? Are people back in their homes again? What kind of connections are driving these? And again, we tested across a number of different theories. The best driver of recovery, of building back afterwards, came from having connections to decision makers, came from trust and interactions with people in positions of power, those linking kind of ties. Where during the disaster, what drove survival came from horizontal connections. In the longer term, the process of recovery came from vertical ties. One more project that we've been working on has come about mental health over time. How do we know what's going to drive people's ability to stay calm, focused, free of anxiety after a major disaster like an earthquake, or in this case, a tsunami and also a radioactive meltdown? We had lots of theories about what could drive this. We've been very lucky working with a community that lived less than 20 kilometers, about 16 miles from the plant itself. And over the last six years, we've asked them questions every year. What's helping you stay calm? How do you ameliorate these feelings of worry, of anxiety, about cancer, about long-term health outcomes? We had a number of different theories about this. What we've seen is individuals exposed to radiation had far higher levels of concern than similar individuals with less of those exposure. In fact, their levels of concern are about two and a half times greater than the average person living in Japan right now. That means they can't sleep at night. They have problems focusing during the day. They have the symptoms that we would call PTSD. But what's kept these symbols down, what's allowed them to get by, haven't been things like wealth or health. Being very, very wealthy or very, very physically healthy didn't reduce concerns and anxiety. Can you imagine what was the best predictor of mental health over time? Social connections. What we found was individuals who knew their neighbors, who had more ties to people living or nearby, who had this sense of belonging, those individuals were able to get through this massive disaster and feel calm, feel less anxiety over time. Now, for us, the bigger question was, in vulnerable populations, among the elderly, among the disabled, what can we do as individuals who live nearby, as individuals who are there, to make that community a pillar of strength, to make that community the driving force within the area? So we had a project that we called Ibasho. Ibasho in Japanese means my place. And the idea was very simple. We knew in communities in Japan that the elderly had been through disasters before. Some of them had been through World War II, others through past earthquakes and tsunami. We wanted to draw on their resources, to draw on their strength, 
and use them as a, an engine for recovery. So we asked them, if we helped them build a space there in their community post-disaster, would they take management, would they take control and create programs that would bring people together to help build trust and build connections over time? It took about six months for them to say yes and two more years to get working. But I can report to you now in 2018, this has been an incredibly successful program with the elderly members of a community called Masakicho in Japan. In fact, it's been so successful, we now have pilot projects in Nepal and in the Philippines as well. These are programs where we help provide a community space, an open space in the area. Those local elderly then decide what kind of programs they run, whether it's going to be yoga, whether it's a library for the children nearby, whether it's programs on cooking, or simply a space to meet together afterwards. And we've been fortunate now to be able to test the community before, during, and after this program, we have measurable impacts in a number of different areas. Individuals going to this community feel more of a sense of place, that feeling of obligation and connection, and they also have more social ties. They have more friends they speak with every single day. So I tried to argue today that at different stages in the disaster, social ties, social cohesion, is the most important aspect of what we can build deliberately. Of course we can build floating houses, of course we can build seawalls, we can all have our emergency kits, and those are very important. But more important, I would argue, in the processes of getting through disaster and then bouncing back afterwards are the kind of connections that we have in our neighborhoods. Do we have trust with each other? Do we have trust in first responders? I try to argue that in the first stage of survival, Having horizontal connections, having people that we know nearby, helps people survive. We have stories, literally, of people being carried to safety on the backs of their neighbors, of individuals checking on people in the 40 minutes between the earthquake and the arrival of the tsunami to make sure that they were safe, or if they weren't, to get them to safety. We know that in the process of rebuilding these cities in Japan, that have been destroyed in many cases completely, what they needed to have were vertical ties, ties to decision makers, ties to individuals like the NEN network here in San Francisco, ties to people like Dan Homsey, like Brian Strong, ties to FEMA and the Red Cross. Those ties help them activate local resources. Then in the longer term, how do we make sure those individuals feel connected to the community and feel calmness? Again, those processes are being driven not by a physical infrastructure, but by a social one. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. Please, yeah, so any yeah. questions for my esteemed colleague? Any questions? Show of hands? Okay, here, oh, here we go. Certain house, here we go. Stand up, please. Carrie Devzak, City of Berkeley. So what are your suggestions when we have these new communities that are um, a combination? I mean, in Japan, we see a very homogenous type of population. Ours is, does not look anything like that. It's a great question. So in fact, we were lucky to begin in Japan, but now we have projects in the Philippines, in Boston, in New Zealand, and in India and Israel as well. And what we found is, it doesn't really matter how homogenous the population is, social ties can be created in the same way that we can create financial wealth through education, the same way that we can create social ties through work. So we actually have five different programs that we've tested. The first one we call the Mr. Rogers Program. Hopefully you guys know Mr. Rogers from your childhoods, I hope. Okay, good. So when I was a kid, every single day, Mr. Rogers asked me to be a good neighbor. And the reality is, if I ask this room right now, how many of you know the first and last name of 10 neighbors? I hope a lot of you would raise your hands, I hope. But the sad reality is, in San Francisco and Boston and in Mumbai, less than one in eight people knows that number of neighbors. In metropolitan areas, no matter whether it's homogenous or heterogeneous, we simply don't know who lives next to us. So right now, for example, in New Zealand, we have programs we're doing to get you to know your neighbor. Very simple idea because they're the zero responders. Before the FEMA, before Red Cross gets there, we need to have people living nearby. So that's the first stage. The second stage we call the neighborhood level. And here you actually have projects in San Francisco like NeighborFest. The idea is individuals who may not meet regularly, individuals who may only meet through a PTA meeting or through a local meeting, wouldn't have that time together. So NeighborFest is one way we do this at the community level. We also talk about design and urban planning. So many of our communities lack parks, third places, 
places where individuals can get together between work and home to meet each other and chat. So right now, for example, in Israel and in Japan, we're designing new condominiums that have private living spaces, but shared working and shared eating spaces. The idea is to build a community that literally has spaces to build together. We also have been working on issues more broadly like how do you get individuals to go to meetings? How do you get them out of their homes, away from their screens, and out to a PTA meeting, to a zoning board meeting, to a local school board meeting? And we're finding that very simple tweaks can make a big difference. For example, do we offer childcare? When are the meetings being offered? Are there multiple times that we could have it during the workday and afterwards? Do we have food for people to come? Do they feel a part of the process? So we're trying to change the meetings themselves to increase that belief that these meetings are for them and by them. One last argument we've tried has been time banking and community currency. These are programs that reward individuals who leave their homes and go volunteer. They do so and are given some kind of reward. It could be a five Berkeley dollars or five Ithaca dollars. It could be one hour in a time bank. And that resource can be exchanged then. I will volunteer for an hour at a school and get back five Berkeley dollars. That money will only work at local mom and pop stores, at a farmer's market, at a barber shop. But we found in all these five programs, increases in trust and cohesion, regardless of the level of homogeneity in the community. I totally agree with what you're saying. Those are the things that Resilientville is about, Resilient Bayview. We want to take some of the monies that you have for the community and give that to the community, those community leaders to work with other people in their community. Because if we don't build these relationships now, we aren't gonna build them after the major catastrophe. What we wanna do is make sure that the community can take care of themselves. Once they take care of themselves, we can take care of everybody else that comes to our community because every community is not gonna be devastated. It's gonna hit in different areas. And if we take those people that's already working at the food pantries, the food banks, the ones that's already in the senior homes and make sure that they are identified, they're taken care of, then they can take care of everybody else. If we can have cooling centers in communities that don't have cooling centers, that are some of the hottest communities in this city, then we can save those lives. And if we don't All build those relationships before it happens, then we're gonna have more death after it happens. Exactly. Question over here, Professor. Or Daniel Holmes, right here, me. Here we go. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much. This was actually, um, a wonderful presentation and not particularly surprising. Um, what I'm actually interested in is your thoughts about in the new electronic social media age where everybody's tied to their screens. And especially in San Francisco, we have the breakdown of the nuclear family or community and we're into the high rises with the 20 some, the millennials or even a little older folks who are completely disengaged, and they're here one day, they may be moving to Houston five years from now, or wherever the next tech boom is. How do we gauge those communities that are incredible social capital, but at the same time, they don't have a connection or roots in the area? This is a really big challenge in tech boom cities like San Francisco, like Boston as well. You also didn't mention the high house cost of, of, of housing here, right, which is also driving out individuals who should be on the front lines, right, with us when we hit a disaster. So th there's no easy answer, I think, as you all know, if you live here. But one approach would be, I think we heard earlier in the day, that when we frame this idea, not as disaster preparedness, not as have your kit and be ready for a bad thing, but look at the good things that we're doing already. Look what our community already has internally. Look at the strengths that we have here, and here's how we want you to be a part of it, right? If my neighbor knocks on my door, it'll be different than if Dan Holmesy, whom I like, will knock on my door, right? We want someone who lives nearby to say to me, Daniel, you have skills that we need, please come join us. Well, your kids already play in the park. Get on the parks committee, right? Your wife is at the YMCA, come join the YMCA board. We want you to talk about about zoning here? Is there fair housing for your kids when they grow up to come back to the area? I think part of the challenge for us in these organizations on the edge of disaster is the framework that we have in mind is always talking about the doom and gloom, right? The negative things that can come. I think the really cool thing about social capital and social cohesion is we can flip that around and say, here's the benefits we'll get right now 
when you know your neighbor and they can watch your house and you're gone for a week, wouldn't you feel more reserved than having some camera on your door all the time? Right? If there is a fire nearby, wouldn't you want neighbors who come to get you out rather than wonder if you're actually living there or not? So these are the kind of things to fr flip that around. Talking to people who are young or old, the screen thing is one quick side thing on this. We found actually, oftentimes nowadays, social media use corresponds with civic engagement. It sounds weird, I know. Um, but what we found is there are different ways to be using your phone, right? If you're on it right now, texting, bad on you. But if you're on it right now, tweeting to friends, telling Facebook about this, buying my book, for example, right? Then we know <laughs> that the outcome is about social connections. And actually, two of my students are doing this as the research projects. We find communities in California during the Napa Valley earthquake that were more online and engaged online civically also got involved in planning and work afterwards in the community nearby. So it wasn't that I'm either on my screen or I'm seeing you face to face. If we use social media and the, and the networks that we have properly, those could be really beneficial leverages for increasing our ties. We have time for one more question. A new voice, new voice. Oh. Daniel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, my name's Ada, and I volunteer for Red Cross. What's very interesting is we need a platform like this. We need someone like Daniel Holmesy who sticks his neck out and says, hey you, you got a talent. Because each one of us, we think we have nothing to offer. We have nothing at the table. But you do, you do have something. And then sometimes you, you might be, you know, not capable of doing a lot of things. You're sitting in a wheelchair and you go, what do I have to offer? If I'm blind or if I'm deaf, I'm going, what do I have to offer? You don't know until you come to something like this. And then you go, hey, you're like me. And then you go, maybe I can offer you something because you don't have that sensitivity. Well, maybe I fed people and you don't know what it takes to open a shelter and feed people. Maybe you don't know about access, and you know, only Hodges knows what people in his community needs. You might come and you're straight laced, you're dressed up, I'm a businessman. I know about computers, I know what to teach you. No, we know what to help you, help us. So you need a place like this. And that's why when you said socialize, the more we socialize, in this type of gathering, the more we know, hey, you can help me. And the more we will think, maybe I can come over and say, hey, Leah, Turk, what is, what, where do you work? And who do you work for? Or I'll go up to Christy and say, what can AT&T do for resilience? But otherwise, if we don't have a place like this, and you don't show up to places like this, you'll never know what you know today. So that's why socializing is so important. And who knows, you might be alive after an earthquake and we'll all be alive together. Because you know what? If I'm Red Cross and my group is all here and there's none of you guys around, that's not a community. It's a lone wolf sitting there going, who can I save? But there's no one to save. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Orchid. I am deaf and I'm uh, representing the deaf community, partly. Uh, in terms of, you know, the Bay Area, there are very, you know, many isolated communities. For example, when there are fires in the North Bay, uh, there was a family of three with a young child. The parents were deaf uh, and asleep. They got up, they smelled, you know, smoke, and they only had 10 minutes to pack everything in, in leave. There was nobody coming to their house to knock or alert them that they needed to uh, escape. So the entire system failed them. And so that's one example. And um, there's another family that was deaf. Uh, while they were asleep, the first responders came in and there was no communication and the family was very shocked. They didn't understand why the person was in their home. And and I don't feel it, it's like a, a statement of us being disconnected from the community. I think it's the general community has stepped away from their connection and awareness with people with disabilities. I think communities of disability are very open and willing to work, but there's a, a real breakdown between the able-bodied community and the disabled community. 
And I think the emphasis, it seems, is that we need to take care of ourselves first. I think one thing, and I appreciate the remarks from our colleague um, at the Red Cross, is during different, remember there's the mitigation phase, there's the preparedness phase, there's a response phase, restoration recovery phases. Different people have the ability to contribute during different phases. If we only focus on people that we think can help us during the response phase, we don't get it. So I don't care what uh, is perhaps you have whatever um, access functional need you have or whatever your perception is about what that term means. The bottom line is this, if you can sit at a table and communicate directly or indirectly in any way, shape or form about how the community can help you and how you can help your community, then you should be at the planning phase without any doubt. There's no excuse, right? And so I think that's what the, the, the mark was. Everybody can contribute in any way, shape. Anyone, there are very few reasons why people may not be able to organize a block party, right? As long as you can be present and communicate and, and lead, right? So I do want to put it out there that, you know, like two years ago we had a heat wave in San Francisco and my father almost died. Um, and it was, his, his, his sister died in 99 in a heat wave. And then um, when the heat wave struck, my sister and I were both in emergency management. We're literally talking to him every hour, trying to make sure he's drinking enough water, but he accidentally took a um, Claritin and dehydrated and went upstairs to his bedroom, which is the hottest room in the house, and fell over and lied there for 12 hours. And if his neighbor didn't come over and check on him in the morning um, and take him to the hospital, he would have died. And my dad's, you know, 92 now at home recovering from a heart attack. And, you know, you would have been like, oh, well, that's because the young person is able-bodied and my dad is vulnerable and that's the paradigm that exists. And in the case of the heat wave, that's what happened. Three months later, my dad, um, an avid hot tubber since 1972, uh, since we built our first hot tub in our backyard, was in his hot tub at 2.30 in the morning because, of course, he sleeps four hours a day, right? Um, and he heard this popping sound. And he, sat, he, he stood out of the hot tub. He looked over the backyard. We have a little fence. And the same neighbor who had saved him, his house was on fire. And not only was the house on fire, but the, the wall underneath his bedroom had caught fire because the coals had blown off of the barbecue and set fire to the shingles. And so my dad hops up at that point, about 89 years of age, runs down, grabs a fire hose, and is putting out the fire and wakes my 50-year-old friend up who then evacuated his 90-year-old mother and got out of harm's way. And I share that story with you because we need to get out of this paradigm of who, can, who is able to do something, who's not able to do something. And, and my dad demonstrated that because in a way, they were even after that, right? And so the joke was my dad bought him a six pack after he took him to the hospital and then my buddy bought him a six pack after he saved his life. So I just wanna offer that everybody can be the hero, a hero or a hero to themselves. But I think we need to create that, that platform and that's what you were talking about for them to make that contribution. So I just wanted to close on that because I do think we need to stop looking at people and pigeonholing them and saying, no matter what happens, you're gonna be a victim. That is actually not the case. So I just wanted to honor her remarks and her remarks because it's very important that we not fall into that trap. And that's what I think today is all about. So thank you very much for coming, Orchid, and my colleagues at the Red Cross.